In a contemporary culture where we are increasingly isolated and divided from our fellow humans, many people have been led astray from a healthy path of growth and inspiration and fallen into painful symptoms of depression, loneliness and disillusionment. There is a growing board of community where we can have honest conversations about complex topics. We need to create spaces for the free thinkers, the outliers and those seeking to further the ideals of the Enlightenment. As two eccentric artists with first-hand experience of surviving mental and social traumas, we share an unrelenting passion for understanding the human condition and continuing the process of navigating it today. This is why I, Laura Becker, an artist and writer from the United States, and me, Vincent Devoni, psychology graduate, have come together across continents, generations, cultures, and life experiences to have these nuanced conversations. We hope you will join us on this journey across the mind on Trans Psyche. Hey everyone, welcome to episode two of the Trans Psyche podcast. And you're with me, Vincent from South Africa. And me, Laura from the United States of America. So today we want to talk about um, a recent letter that Laura posted on her Twitter feed, which got a lot of attention um, around her detransitioning and her experience with uh, the surgeons. So, Laura, do you want to tell us what exactly happened there? Right. So, you know, I've been thinking for a while, I want to contact my surgeon, the surgeon who um, performed the top surgery and mastectomy when I was 20, um, because I wanted to inform him that I've detransitioned to, one, show him slash just the public in general that, you know, detransition does happen and transition regret it is a thing and it's a very real thing and it's an increasingly common thing. Um, and just inform him specifically like, Hey, you're like former patient. Um, you know, I'm your former patient. And, you know, I was 20 when you remove my breasts and I was very mentally ill at the time. And I don't think that this was a good decision. I don't think I should have been allowed to do this. Um, and just, you know, Basically, it was, you know, more it was well, it was better written than that. But like I was just saying, like, just, you know, consider that, you know, your ethical duty to do no harm first, do no harm. And, you know, it is harmful if there's not enough gatekeeping procedures and the letters that I received um, because he was trying to operate under the WPATH standards of care, which require two letters from, you know, um, doctor, mental health professionals. But I basically told him those letters that I received were not properly gatekeeped. I was, you were trying to do the right thing by asking for those two letters, but the two letters came from people that weren't gatekeeping me. They were not adequate assessments of my mental health. I mean, my psychiatrist um, told me, wrote in the letter to him that I seemed mentally stable. And a few weeks after she wrote that I was in the hospital again for suicidal ideation um and very very unstable and so i don't know why she she didn't do a proper assessment and the other letter i got was from my general practitioner who didn't hardly know me at all and was not treating me whatsoever for mental health i mean i just saw her like once a year um and she was like sure you know i'll write you this letter i don't think she asked any questions about it she just um she just wrote it so you know he's if he was trying to cover himself you know by saying well, yeah i followed the WPATH standards of care, like the standards of care were not followed. And in addition to that, I don't think you should be operating on young girls anyway, even if the WPATH standards of care were technically followed. Yeah. Um, because, and on his website, I saw that he works with minors. So I believe girls as young as 16 are having their breasts removed because they want to be men. I don't think that this is acceptable at all for anyone under at least 21, I was 20 at the time, at least 21, if not 25, because the brain isn't even developed until 25. So I basically wrote him that and I said, check out, um, you know, I sent, I put in a couple links, you know, to show like, I think I put in um, Lisa Littman's study, uh, the detransition study to mm -hmm. show like 60% of the people in the detransition study, you know, transition due to trauma and mental health related reasons. And 25% were um, gay. So it's it's really dangerous yeah. territory to be doing this. So that's what I wrote in the letter. 
And my intention of the letter was to be, you know, um, polite um, and uh, rational and calm, but also, you know, honest and bold and, um, you know, just very forthright about it. And I think that's how it came off. So I posted the letter on Twitter to show my followers who are mostly uh, people concerned with gender issues, parents or, um, you know, other other people concerned with gender critical stuff. And it got a very overwhelmingly positive reception. Um, you know, a lot of people retweeted it. A lot of people quote tweeted it and added their own thing like this is really important. But then it started getting a lot of negative feedback as well. Um, and the negative feedback, there was two different sort of main points. One point was basically, well, you made your decision. You have to take personal responsibility. I'm not sure why you're blaming someone for some, you know, why are you blaming the doctor? Like, this was your choice. This is what you wanted. And it's your own problem that you have to live with. And I don't know why you're, you know, blaming others for your own mistakes, basically personal accountability type thing, but in a really kind of cruelly said way. The other one was basically, well, your experience doesn't speak for all trans people, and you are making it so much harder for trans people to access the proper life-saving care that they need. And just because it didn't work out for you doesn't mean it won't work out for other people. And now it's going to be so much harder. And like, basically, why are you like taking out your frustrations on trans people, you know? And then there was a couple weird ones. Uh, we can maybe get oh, into those, but the, Vincent, uh, that, yeah, that, that's kind of the, mo the main two one. ones. Yeah. The, 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 you don't speak for other trans people. Because I, I saw some of these, these comments. Um, the thing is, I didn't see any specifics of how you are making it harder. Um, I suppose they think that if you shut down that surgeon, that'll be one less surgeon doing um, uh, double mastectomies on demand. Right. <laughs> Is that their, their logic? I mean, because they didn't, the ones I saw, they didn't actually give a coherent explanation for, for what, why they think you're going to affect the treatment of genuine um, gender dysphoric people. Right. And because the thing, they, the, another theme was that was a lot in the second one was like, well, why are you seeking legal action? You don't have a legal case. And it was very much about the law and legality of it. And I said, like, well, I think I've been pretty clear that this is has no legal intention. Um, I'm not seeking mm -hmm. legal repercussion. Although a lot mm -hmm. of people did tell me, like, you should sue. A lot of people <laughs> told me that. Um, and I said, like, I'm not currently pursuing that. Um, and so th it, their arguments were very weak. They were basically very, you know, broadly projecting, like, you know, this is just an example of you are an example of a transphobic person or, you know, someone who is just making it harder. Like there should be no gatekeeping. In my opinion, it was very selfish. Um, you know, their remarks because, you know, mm. they couldn't possibly take the perspective of someone who, um, had a really kind of traumatic medical experience when they were like suicidal, um, and like 20 years old and they are informing their surgeon that, that it didn't work out and maybe he should consider, you know, his practices or like reconsider the process. Um, so to protect other people from going through the same thing, but they mm -hmm. took that, you know, in my opinion, very genuine active kind of goodwill and advocacy for other young girls, basically mentally ill girls, um, like me and twisted it around to say that I was selfish, but in reality, they were being the selfish ones for even for, just having no empathy at all. And then, of course, the ones that literally said, like, well, fuck you, basically, you know, you just have to, yeah. you know. And some of them were quite cruel. I mean, it, you know, it's, it, it is Twitter, so, you know, but that was those were probably some of the cruelest comments that I've ever gotten. Um, and this is the most backlash that I've ever received so far. Stay tuned. But, um, yeah. you know, there might be more. A sequel probably will. A couple, mm -hmm. a whole... Uh, universe of that or a cine cinematic what do you call that the uh yeah the universe the funk god universe you know um some of them were like uh you know you you kind of ruined yourself or like you um deserved it or like this is what you get yeah. for being mentally ill or this is what you get for being a tranny or you know this is what you kind of get for 
you know, being stupid, basically, like just saying like, well, you were stupid and, you know, you made a dumb mistake. Everyone makes stupid and dumb mistakes. So why are you special and why do you get to complain about it? And just things that are just like, seems like you maybe have some kind of bitterness about something you've made in your life. Like who, what, what like well-adjusted <laughs> person, even if you don't agree with what they're saying, who goes around saying like, you know, your medical trauma was, <laughs> you know, just fuck you for that. Like you deserved it. Like it's not, it's well, not, saw, it's not normal. I saw your one comment, um, which I'm only, I'm, I'm not going to bring up all your, your comments on the thread, but the one that where you said you sound like a, um, D, D, what detransition phobic. Oh yeah. Someone, because someone, <laughs> someone was like, you are so clearly a trans. Be well, one person said like, your letter was great. It was fine up until the end when it got really transphobic. And I said, what was transphobic about it? Because it, there was nothing, you know, it was, it was at the end, I was basically saying like, you know, I think you should reconsider like operating, you know, doing cosmetic surgery or, or these procedures on young girls, many of whom are unstable. And so that was apparently transphobic. And so the person was, I was like, well, what is an example? And they were like, oh, well, you know, just, I didn't even have to give an example. It's just so clear, you know, from reading it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, it's seen in there, like, you're just a trans, you're just transphobic. And I said, well, it seems like you're a little detransphobic. So I, I want to point something out here that I've been holding my tongue on um, since you posted that letter. And, and that's why I specifically wanted to ask you, um, what are the actual arguments? Because I've actually got the letter um, on the screen now. Okay. And, and I, I just went through it again just to make sure that I'm not, um, uh, you know, being, being biased here. But there's nothing transphobic in it. It's totally realistic. It's from a, a, an empirical perspective, um, which that means is, is that you're speaking from a, a, a experiential perspective and you're reminding someone of their entire profession's ethical duty to do no harm, which should be a universal <laughs> understanding that, that people should avoid. And then the thing that, that comes out in these kinds of threads, which to someone like me is just absolutely fascinating. Like I actually want to start documenting such an example of where you can, you can see where ideology replaces rationality. You know, and, and I know other people are talking about this a lot recently. You know, Steven Pinker seems to have a knack for producing books at the right time about the right topic. And he's done this book called Rationality, which I haven't actually read yet, but I've read all these other books. So I'm, I'm confident that he's got it right. Um, but it, 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 it's the point that I'm making is that there's no, they, they, what they do when, when someone reverts to name calling without specific arguments, that's a sign of ideology. It's a sign that they're captured by the cognitive dissonance the, the literal pain of having to consider someone else's perspective which conflicts with their own and what happened in that thread was exactly that where there were all these people that i suppose your followers were the first people to to support you and respond and then of course they reshare and that's when you start getting the trolls and the outliers and that's when they start um you know depending on the time of day and whatever. I've noticed that sometimes people post things um, at, you know, midnight USA time, and it's only by the next day that there's responses and, and backlash. So it's I, got a lot to do with who's awake at the time. You know? True. I mean, I don't know because I do post, a, I have no, I post around the clock. But what amazes me is they've got all that time. You see my point? They've got all that time to come up with an actual argument, you know, link even if it's a newspaper article, you know, I prefer <laughs> a proper study or some kind of research. You know, like you mentioned, as soon as you started talking, you mentioned Lisa Littman's study, which I know a lot of people don't like and they don't want to agree with it. But she's followed all the proper, proper, proper mythology of, of doing these studies. Same with the stuff that James Cantor does as well. Um, I don't agree with everything James Cantor says, but he does everything properly. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you don't like the findings, then... You know, you should you should either make a, a convincing argument or go and do the research yourself. Right. On what Don't shoot the messenger, doing, right? Exactly, exactly. And what I find so amazing is it's just incredible how the people that have this empirical lived experience, all right, like you, from having, um, 
you know, I mean, we don't have to go into it completely, but just because you were, you said you were 20 when you started. Yes. A bit earlier. Well, 20 yeah, when I 20. medically transitioned. So, so it's just amazing how they just assume that at 20, you knew what you were doing. You must take responsibility for your life. Okay. But they don't, they're not interested because they are interested in lots of other categories of people's um, comorbidities and psychopathology, all right? Because they use that very often to defend their behavior. Right, but exactly. When it comes to someone who's reversed her behavior because she's had an epiphany that she made a massive mistake, um, and I'm, I'm only quoting you there, just so yes. everyone knows. Um, and and, and just, just for context, like, I think if, if you listen to our first episode as well, um, the idea of our podcast is to, uh, like I was saying earlier, to try and work through these things. It's not a matter of um, we're not here to sort of um, necessarily prevent people doing stuff, but it's certainly to raise awareness and, and, and like show people how between your struggles and my struggles that I've had um, in my own life, how people can get through these things by talking and by, by thinking about it openly. Right. This is, why it's so important to have an open discussion platform like, mm -hmm. like, like a podcast. Um, so, so, sorry, I, 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 do, do you want to say some more about the letter? Because I think there's a couple of other things that, that sort of run there. Um, well, the theme of like reminding someone to do no harm is just to me, it's amazing that that's even necessary. Well, like, I, and, and I, you know, I wasn't trying to be, I mean, yeah, I was a little poetic i'm always a little poetic even when i'm being my most you rational have to be. I, ha I am incapable <laughs> of not but i wasn't trying to be dramatic or you know over the top um when i was saying like first you know remember like do no harm um mm. i was kind of just saying like listen whether you knew it or not and i don't know I, I mean a lot of people do make judgments on these doctors some fervently believe that they really don't care they're just out to make money I do agree that that's happening. I don't know this person. It, it's very likely that that's part of it. But it's also likely that he thinks of himself as a good guy who is trying to do a, you know, humanitarian cause as well. And maybe he doesn't question, you know, he just conveniently doesn't question, you know, the other risks, you know, because he thinks he's doing well. And maybe he hasn't heard about detransition. So it's a good faith argument mm -hmm. on my part, because I never once said you are causing harm. I never said like, you have harmed me. It wasn't anything like that. It wasn't accusatory. It was very much just saying like, I have been harmed by this inadvertently. And I think you should consider the other risks that are associated with this. And it's more complicated than perhaps either of us thought, or perhaps the popular discourse thinks right now that you might be yeah. following. And you man, just the vitriol to something so, you know, straightforward, um, you know, which is just like, I, Hey, FYI, like this didn't work out. Maybe just think about it a little more. Um, is can I just for the listeners? Can I just remind everyone what we're talking about here? Um, I, and I'm sorry to do this, Laura, to rub it in. Uh... You, had, you had a double mastectomy, and um, I, I know I'm just going to remind you of something that I don't know if we recorded, but something that you said once before that you realized that what you really wanted to do, you were in such a state um, during this transitioning process that what you were really trying to do was to, and I'll, I'll, I'll quote you just so that I don't put words in your mouth. You were really trying to stab yourself in the heart. No, Instead that's, that's, that's your... not, that's not the correct quote. It's similar. What it was, the yeah. quote was, was I really just wanted to remove my broken heart. Yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Because my Sorry. breaths were suspiciously close to my heart, weren't they? To your heart, yeah. Yeah, yeah. literally. I mean, again, it's not being dramatic. It's <laughs> literally. A, yeah, I mean, and this is why I want to remind everyone what we're talking about here. You know, you had you had your your God given body part removed. Yeah. Um, for you know, and I I don't want to get too um, sucker analytic or. or Jungian here, but um, no, that's all right. It's a, it, it it's better be Jungian. It's like, well, yeah. 
Because <laughs> the idea of, um, and, and okay, so let me just explain to everyone that there's a little bit of history with myself. Um, uh, it's, a, it's totally different, but it is in some ways similar. Where I spent seven years um, orthorexic and basically anorexic when I was younger, and I I was I was trying to waste away the parts of myself that I didn't like. Mm -hmm. So this is something that Laura and I connect on, and it's one of the reasons we have this podcast at all. Um, is that you've got a 48 year old man in South Africa and a 24 year old female in America who have struggled with the same sort of core issues, but from totally different generations totally different um uh what they thought were solutions you know um and that's what's so important to remember here is like you you, you have these struggles at at, at 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 different stages of life but but for both of us it was around that adolescent phase okay um and my resource at the time was to kind of starve myself and become the obsessive so, um your solution was to transition and to have a double mastectomy. And, and, and anyone who's been through this in any form knows that it was a matter of time until you internally developed the structures to get through it. And instead, there were people on the outside who effectively weaponized your, um, your crisis to whether it's make money from you or to um, you know, support their own ideas. You know, some... I just want people to understand that I think there's a lot more going on here than just the letter that you wrote. It's the doctor uh, breaking his ethical boundaries and people using this for their own ideas. Mm -hmm. And not, again, not just him. Um, I, I mean, I did get a few people saying like, well, why are you blaming the surgeon? You know, again, I did not blame him. I just informed him. The letter was literally titled... Um, what was it titled, Vincent? You have it pulled up. It was titled um, Notification of Detransition. Notification, mm. right? That's very, very, uh, you know, straightforward. Not, it wasn't like accusation, right? It was notification. So, but there are some people that are saying, well, why blame him? Like, why not blame, you know, your other doctors? Or why not blame, you know, yourself or, you know, the media or whatever, you know? And I said, like, first of all, like I said, I'm not blaming him. Um, there's many people who I feel failed to me, including myself. Um, and unfortunately, the psychiatrist who the main person that actually diagnosed me with gender dysphoria, which that process involved me seeing her one time and being like, um, I think I'm trans and I have gender dysphoria. And she was like, okay, I'll look it up. And then the next time she was like, yeah, I think you meet the, I think you meet the, um, I think you meet the diagnosis for gender dysphoria. So I will give you that label. Right. She had to look it up. Yes. She knew a little bit about it, but she had to look it up basically. And she was like, All right. she, she was being careful. She thought she was being careful, but the problem is deeper than even this, that is the problem that the definition of gender dysphoria the criteria is bullshit the, the criteria for gender dysphoria could basically just be autism or trauma or just being quirky or a lesbian or gay man yeah. um yeah. it's just a lot of stereotypes a lot of stereotypes and i did meet all the criteria for gender dysphoria but she never did more evaluation than that you know, it'd be like if I came in and said, I think I have borderline personality disorder because I did also meet a lot of criteria for that, too. And um, if she was like, sure, yeah, I think you meet it. Like, it doesn't matter what the condition is. Like, if you meet someone one or two times and then you give them a diagnosis, you know, that's that's not very that's not good practice as well. Like you're giving them a diagnosis and then writing them a, a surgery letter. You know, I mean, I hadn't even started testosterone yet when I got that um, letter, I believe, or I'd only really? been on like a month because I, oh my God. yeah, I started this all like right at the same time. So, you know, it's, you know, it's bad enough that I started testosterone in when I just turned 20. So that would have been in January of 2017. Mm. And I had the surgery seven months later in August of 2017. Oh, so, wow. Okay. I didn't realize this was so... Uh, shortly after you even started the process yeah i mean i had been debating about being trans i mean i did identify as trans but mostly just socially um and i grappled with if what what should i should do for about two years before i finally was just like you know what i guess i'll just transition 
And when I said that, and definitely a very reckless and desperate suicidal mindset, uh, you know, they just said, sure, you know, here you go. And, you know, there was no thought. Again, there was no thought on her part, the GP's part, or the surgeon's part. And on my part, my thought was completely irrational. Um, so I'm not sure why people make the argument that, you know, well, why didn't you think? It's just like, you think I wasn't thinking about this? I was ruminating about it for like five years. I was thinking about yeah. this. It's just that my thoughts were disturbed. I was mentally ill and suicidal. Um, yeah. So, you know, it, it definitely was um, very rushed. And that's that's part of the, you know, the standards of care, the WPATH standards of care. I don't know the exact quote, but you're not supposed to rush the process. You know, you're supposed to take some time, you know, living in the opposite sex role and all these different things that they suggest. Yeah. Um, and additionally, I should say that the WPATH standards of care are just guidelines. All right. It's not like they're like they are considered the top guidelines because they were yeah. like the first ones to do it because they originally were the Henry Benjamin standards of care. So they were just mm -hmm. the first standards of care. It just doesn't mean that there's not alternative models or um, modalities of standards exactly. of care. They they have just authority because it just because there weren't that many trans people originally, and they were the first ones to do it. And then it's risen to this level where suddenly they're respected as the be all and end all. But the WPATH, mm. you know, members will even say that they don't have all the answers, and they'll even say that their standards of care were meant for adults. They were not meant for adolescents, and they've had to kind of navigate the big rush of adolescents yeah. doing transitioning. Exactly. So it's not like so again, like the doc, the, all the surgeons protect themselves by saying they're using the standards of care. Again, they're not really using it though, and even if they were, the standards of care are, are not that great because the definition of gender dysphoria is is based in stereotypes. It comply to a ton of different stuff. Mm. Well, I must add at this point um, that. I so when I started my training four years ago, um, uh, so I've got a um, I've got a degree in psychology. The training said um, that the AFIRM protocols are the standard of care. Okay, and as an adult, a mature adult in in this class, I was I didn't know much about this, but I was like, I mean, just logically, that doesn't make sense to me. You know, if, if I, 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 there's, unfortunately, there's no good metaphor for this such a serious thing. But um, if you just walk into a doctor's office and say, "You know what? I think um, I think I've got toothache. Can you just pull out the, the back row of my teeth, all of them?" You know, the doctor doesn't just automatically do it. He 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 does an X-ray and he checks all sorts of things and he finds out you've got an abscess. Um, actually in your gum line and no teeth need to be pulled out. You know, mm -hmm. like I said, there's no good metaphor for this. So sorry. Well, there, but, you know what the good metaphor is? Your story, like the story of your eating disorder, right? Like the difference between mm -hmm. our stories is that you, you know, we had a similar bodily issue that was self-destructive, mm -hmm. but you, you know, were ma managed to struggle through it and survive it and come out of it on your own to be perfectly physically healthy. Um, even though you're old now, sorry. But <laughs> I don't think of you as that old, but I, you know, <laughs> I'm just, I'm just poking fun. But the, um, but, but I was, you know, at the same sort of stage of crisis or really even earlier, cause you came out of it, what, like when you're like 26 or 27. Yeah. And I was yeah. still like 20, 20, in the beginning. 20, no, 23, 23, 24. Okay. Okay. So it, was, it was seven years. So there's, there's an interest. Well, there's an interesting uh, observation there that you know these 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 adolescent identity crises, um, I think, do take years to resolve. Mm -hmm. Sorry, carry on. What do we well, I was just yeah. So you know the difference is that you know you didn't go to a doctor and say like you know I really think that you know my body. I really think that I'm overweight, and I really think that you know I need to be thinner. Mm -hmm. And you know I'm, and then you would you know tell the doctor, yeah, I'm like you know doing you know I'm an alcoholic or I'm doing drugs or you know I have depression, yeah. anxiety. Uh, you know I have this history of you know childhood trauma and abuse. Um, and you know I I this is what I'm eating and blah blah blah. And then the doctor's like, oh, yeah, that really sounds really bad. We better, like, make sure that you lose that weight right away. And we better you get you. Weight. Right. You need to lose more weight. That's exactly the, that's exactly what happened when I went in. Yeah, and 
and said, like, yeah, I'm suicidal. I have autism. I'm doing this and this and that. And instead, you know, the informed consent clinic, when I got the testosterone, the surgeon and the psychiatrist were all like, yeah, yeah, that seems uh, all right. Well, sure. Let's 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 do this because you seem mentally stable, which is just it's, well, it's just, just bizarre to me. Let's just talk about that for a second. The, the informed consent. OK. Did they tell you all the side effects of testosterone? They said, you know, the very limited and very standard, like, do you, you know, you will, you know, your voice will deepen. And, you know, I don't, they definitely didn't go into all, you know, because they hadn't even studied it. And, and I'm still learning things about testosterone, but not from them. I'm learning about it from, you know, D-trans people or trans yeah. people who have, who spoke yeah. about what it did to their bodies. Like, you know, we, yeah. They, so yeah, I'm sure they did give me a packet of information, but it was very, um, you know, shallow. It's, it, it just it just amazes me, you know, because we get we get ethics drummed into us, drummed into us. You can't do this and you can't do that and you can't do all these things. There's all these things you can't do. The point that you start wondering, well, I'm 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 afraid to even mention um, Freud or Jung because somebody might get offended and <laughs> run screaming out the office. You know? Wow. But but it amazes me that um, I mean, just look at what we're saying that. You know, the one side of, of the ideology that's going around, the one side says we must listen to people's lived experiences. Okay? So the, the, the whole lived experiences thing, um, it, it, it's funny because I've actually used lived experience in my own writing, but I'm very specific about my lived experience with orthorexia or with um, growing up in apartheid or... Uh, whatever, whatever other topics, I will use that phrase, lived experience, but I'm very specific about what I'm talking about. And then I will go on to what we do know, because, um, you know, there, there, there's an experience. My lived experience of orthorexia was um, I got a lot of attention. Um, it was quite creepy how many people, uh, girls and boys, are drawn to very thin people. And people that, that have got such conviction about their diet, it, it was very captivating. People, if I had people over for dinner, they would listen to me for two hours talking about how I created this meal, because I'm, I'm a chef as well. And it, it, was, it was quite good for my ego, of course, you know, because he has the evidence. Look, I'm so thin, you know. And of course, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of women are, are, are envious of, of any thin body, but when they meet a thin man, it's like, I don't know, there's something else that gets triggered. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Um, but what I'm saying is, it's amazing how we validate the lived experience. But then when someone like you comes up and says, I've had surgery, I've taken years of, or was it months of testosterone? Just seven months. Seven months of testosterone, major surgery, and a, and a major mental health crisis that I'm that I'm that I'm still navigating yeah. at the age of 24. And everyone's like, "Oh, shut up." <laughs> you know. It doesn't fit their I, narrative. I just I just and this is the thing is that, is that that's what I as as um and I think this is where it helps being South African because I'm I'm very much um coming at it from an outsider's perspective um where the where the, it's so distinct to me that there's this ideology at play versus People's actual lived experiences. And, what, okay, I suppose what's more important here is what you're actually saying, which is I had a mental health crisis. And, and no one's listening to you. <laughs> you know, no one's interested in that. All they're interested in is that you're speaking out against the trans community. But you're not at all. Right. I'm advocating <laughs> for people who identify as trans. Because, like I said in the letter, yeah. there, it's not just me. I know I pointed to several links, several studies, and... You know, yeah. like, you know, just saying like the, the number of detransitioners is, you know, on the rise. And, you know, that's not me just saying my lived experience. That's also like em empirical data. Um, exactly. But it doesn't fit their narrative. And like I myself am aware, you know, of my own lived experience because I do think to myself, I mean, I have a pretty solid foundation i think for you know many of the things i'm saying are, i think are quite reasonable like we should not allow at least people under 21 to transition i don't think that that's unreasonable at all by any means um but then there is the fact that there's people who have lived experience that's different from mine right and that's what i consider too i consider the fact that 
there are trans people who are older in life, they've successfully transitioned and they seem happy and stable, men and women. And that, you know, some would argue would, you know, conflict with my quote unquote narrative or ideology. But, but, but the difference is that I'm very curious why they are, you know, that worked out for them. I'm very curious what the difference was. And so were they like the same, the reasonable trans people on Twitter are saying the same things that people like me are saying, you know, they are saying like, no, this is not the same experience that I had, you know, and this would not work out for someone who's that young and that unstable, you know, like the, the reasonable trans people are saying the same things that I'm saying. Um, and so again, lived experience isn't everything, but if there's a really common experience that's happening and it's increasing more and more and more, we should just ignore that because it might quote unquote prevent life. You know, someone might kill themselves. It's just like, well, guess what? Like, what if I killed myself? Like, what is that? What? That doesn't matter at all. Like I easily well, could be around. You, if you did, you wouldn't be around to write these transfer letters. <laughs> right, exactly. See, they, they don't want... <laughs> to be relief. Right, right. So they don't actually care about dysphoric people. They don't care about trans people. They only exactly. care about their own selfish, insecure ego needs. Um, and now I, I want to point out just, just one of the weirdest things um, from one of the responses was... Not weird, but just very you know, it pissed me off, um, but it was also hilariously irrational. Um, so, so, you know, I got into a discussion with, um, I believe it was a non-binary person. So it was a woman who was non-binary, maybe trans. And she was, you know, arguing that I, um, you know, I don't know, she was making some point about mastectomy. And I said, I don't think we should remove the healthy breasts of minors or people under the age of 25. Like as a rule, I, I just, and she basically said, you're being so creepy. Like, it's just so creepy and weird that you're even discussing this. You are really? using, yeah, she was like, you're using language. Like, basically, it's sexual harassment. It is sexual harassment to use the term healthy breasts. What am I, some sort of cattle? I'm not your breeding cow. I'm not your milkmaid, you know, and all you see is breasts. And I, and I retweeted it, and I said, this is internalized misogyny at play because... Like, you're so insecure about your own womanhood that you are getting upset about another woman using the term healthy breasts to describe, you know, just physical body parts, anatomical body parts that were removed due to mastectomy. Like, what do you think a mastectomy is? It's removal of healthy, like, it's a removal of breasts. And in this case, they were healthy organs. But this person really was adamant that this was, like, creepy and sexual. And then another person chimed in and was like, it's basically sexual harassment if you keep referring to secondary sex characteristics if someone has told you that they make that that makes them uncomfortable. And I said I'm not going to be gaslit into thinking that. First of all, this person came onto my post talking about yeah. this subject. So they knew what they were getting into. If it actually triggered yeah. them, they would not engage with this material. And so that's absolute bullshit. Also, it's bullshit to say that that's sexual harassment. <laughs> like that come on. Like and and you know, I just it that was just just really it's like, and that's when I quickly, you know, maybe a few hours later, I muted the whole thing after that. I didn't want to Good. because I was getting a lot of positive feedback and some interesting dialogue, but I muted the whole thing because I'm just like, I can't, it is a waste of time to try to rationally engage with people this unhinged, you know, and unstable. Well, I think let's, let's be, you know, let's be honest about as much as you and I are both quite active on Twitter, the analogy I used was it's like standing in a park you know, screaming your opinions day and all night. The, the problem is, uh, it's not just a park. It's not like a public park. You know, if when you go down to the public park, um, the chances are a lot of the people in the park are your neighbors. Um, and a lot of them are quite civilized. <laughs> this is more like standing um, in, in, the, um, in the, the high street where all the, all the big nightclubs are at three in the morning and screaming your opinion. Actually, Twitter's a lot more like that, <laughs> um, where the chances are you're going to upset someone. I mean, I, I had an evening out the other night with, with um, my, my, my cohort, and um, we all had a few drinks. And by the end of the evening, one of the girls who you and I get along very well, um, just a perfect example. You know, I said something which was a one-line quip, um, which should have been seen in context, but because she didn't hear everything else I said, 
she got quite offended by it. And then when I tried to correct myself, I accidentally waved my finger at her. Now, keep in mind, I've known this girl for four years. It's not like we don't know each other, you know. But more upset. Anyway, we all, we resolved it. But that was an example of what I'm talking about. Is Twitter is like being out at a nightclub at three in the morning varying degrees of drunk people. <laughs> yeah, and everything's taken out of context. Everything, everything. So um, so I want to, uh, if you don't mind, I want to just analyze this um, this, this last comment. Uh, post yeah, said. it's um, very uh, uh, psychologically um, interesting. This is just precious, precious material. <laughs> um, that, you know, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, start off this by reading something that I just happened to post the other day. Um, uh, and it's by, uh, it's, it's quoted from an article that I read on um, Foucault, right? Uh, now Foucault, he's a controversial figure, Michel Foucault, he's one of the postmodernists. Um, he's got all sorts of uh, historical um, deviant behavior that we could go into. But just to give you an idea, of where I think that post is coming from. I quote, those planning suicide, he mused, this is someone writing about Foucault's book, could look for partners without names for occasions to die liberated from every identity. So just to be clear that what he's saying there, and this is stuff that was written, um, he might have written that in the 60s or 70s, died in the 80s. Um, the, again, I'm, I'm tying this back to ideology, that the ideology is, that your identity is central to, to regardless of your physical um, manifestation. So this woman that's that that well this non-binary that's that's assuming that you're you're um, uh, categorizing her as like a breeding um, stock is is I would say you know you said it's internalized misogyny um, and projection of her own insecurities. You know I would actually go uh, when, and, you know, obviously I'm not supposed to be diagnosing people on, on Twitter, but I, as, a, as a group, those people are actually suffering from what Michelle Foucault did in that quote there. Um, when you release yourself from any um, bonds to the community, to the people around you, and you've, you've considered and maybe even attempted suicide. Michelle Foucault attempted suicide, I believe, a couple of times. I can't remember hmm. the number now. But you're, you're talking about – so I've also attempted suicide. I, um, I've, I've come back from that when I was much younger. I was 13 when I did that. Um, and I understand this thinking that you make a choice when you decide to live, when you decide to stick around. You make a choice, okay, I'm going to live, or you make the choice – okay, I'm just going to use this world for all my personal gratification because that's all that matters in the end. And, you know, you know come, in comes this, um, to this as the, um, the nihilistic atheist who believes it's just one life and you've got to burn it at both ends, baby. And that's it, you know. Yeah. Michel Foucault, I mean, I don't want to go into too much uh, detail, but anyone can look up. Um, well, certainly the article that I attached to that post was very, very good um, and ties with all the stuff that I've read. Uh, I've read Michel Foucault himself. so I, We can link that in the description. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Um, because you need to understand what, what, what the non-binary that responded to you um, is manifesting all those ideas of um, essentializing her internal, their internal identity and um, this, this nihilistic view of what the purpose of our lives is and what your purpose is on this planet, you know. So for them to get offended by you suggesting that breasts have a function <laughs> um, shows this complete rejection of, and it's, it, you know, there's a, there's a, I'll admit that there's a certain element of, um, let's say, um, uh, the individuals striving towards their own goals, which is important in this conversation. Okay, so in psychology as well, we accept that people are striving towards their own goals. But when you unhinge yourself from the greater good of the community, or at very least the immediate people around you, you've effectively become a rogue agent, and you become 
the 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 nihilist that was uh, demonstrated by Michel Foucault's life that he bragged about my phrase, but burning life at both ends, um, meaning that you're doing so much destructive behavior that you, you corner yourself and there's nowhere left to go. Mm -hmm. um, so like you said, I just want to pick out that phrase because I've heard it a lot, this internalized misogyny. And I'm going to propose that it's actually, it's actually like a remnant of suicidal or suicide ideation um, that whether or not they've attempted suicide or not, it's, for me, it's on a similar continuum of being a, a, a consumer of life rather than a um, producer, you know, a, a, a producer, exactly, or a collaborator, you know, a, a part of your community. And, and, and when I say community, I mean, your community could literally be three people. As soon as you, as soon as you situate yourself into this dynamic of three or four people, or ideally, obviously, or three um, or four rats. Actually, any living being. That's actually a very good point because why is it we always talk about the elderly getting pets? The same thing. Mm -hmm. This is how you are hardwired to to function and to achieve any kind of. Um, uh, so, well, I'll bring it back to good mental health and well-being. The only way you achieve this is by understanding what I'm talking about: the sense of community, the sense of living for others, even if it's a rat. <laughs> really, um, you know, I, I spent like a year trying to convince my, my very elderly father to get a dog. And um, when he said he, he didn't want to, it was because he didn't want to leave the dog alone when he died. Hmm. I mean, it, it, it just, it, it, you know, so, so because he said no to that, it actually forced me to visit him more often. <laughs> so there's all these peripheral, there's all these knock on effects when you accept your role and the importance of having those other connections. You know, but do, do you get what I mean? Like the, the yes. internalized misogyny. I mean, it's internalized. Is, uh, it well, I think it is partially internalized misogyny. But what is misogyny? It's hatred of woman. But if you are a woman, it means you hate yourself too. Yes. So it's very much. It's you know the yeah. It is internalized misogyny in general as a cultural thing. It seems very pornographic. What she was saying to me yes. because I told her this. I said like. You know, you're the only one in this conversation using this language. Like, I never brought up that yeah. language at all. And in fact, it sounds like porn language. You know, I've seen that, you know, yeah. por por pornographic language, you know, the, I'm not going to get into it. But like, if anyone knows about hue cows or like, you know, milking fetish, you know, just there's a lot of that sort of thing. Breeding, mm -hmm. breeding cows. You know, if you're jumping, if your mind is jumping to that, what does that say about what you, you know, think of women or what you think of yourself? Um, and I want to also bring up one of the other really worry, um, more concerning comments um, was another young, you know, FTM. I don't know how young they were, but they seemed very immature because they were saying, you know, they were arguing like, well, who needs breasts? FTM is female to female male. To male. It's, it's, Hopefully if anyone listening to this yeah. knows what that is is all the other stuff we're talking about but yes a female to male a lot of people don't <laughs> yeah so talking about detransition that's, that's a whole other thing but um so this person was a you know a young woman who is identifying as a man and she was talking about how she wants to have top surgery and i think she was angry because by me saying like what if maybe you didn't perform top surgery in some cases to this surgeon or even any cases depending um you know she was basically like, what if I can't get my surgery or, you know, so, but she was saying like, you know what, like, why do I need breasts? Like, I don't, I literally don't need them. Like, there's just something external that I don't, I don't even use them. I, I don't even need them. And in fact, getting rid of them might actually be helpful to me. You know, it prevents breast cancer. And then someone else, you know, said like, so you would just get rid of, you know, say your appendix just because you just weren't using it right now. And the person was like, I mean, yeah, you can just get rid of any body part that you're not using. Like it's, and I, it just was really disturbing because it's like this person almost views their body as just like a customizable avatar that doesn't have like real Spizable. world context. Yeah. And then someone was like, what do you think breasts actually do? Like, what what do you think the function of them is? And, you know, it seemed like she just had no concept of it, probably because she was pretty young. And, you know, I didn't have a concept of like having children or things like that or you know in my mind i was like well breasts are you know that's what they're for or whatever but like it was not a it was detached and this is so this person seems so incredibly detached from their body 
but they were saying like, I don't need breasts. Like I really don't need any body parts. I mean, I can just kind of do whatever I please with it. And it doesn't really matter because, you know, there might be illness or, you know, they seem to have a very nihilistic and hopeless view of things, but they would yeah. probably say that they feel totally fine. You know, they would be in denial. It seemed that's yeah. what it sounded like. I wonder, if, uh, I wonder if there's a, there's like a, cause I'm just thinking about the other side of this, you know, you're like, you're saying this person was quite young. Um, I wonder if we've just failed to, you know, has, has the internet taken up so much bandwidth in some of these people's um, lives that they haven't been exposed to the, you know, uh, I mean, I don't want to give away my age here, but like, uh, well, it's I'm in our show notes. Well. <laughs> it is, yeah. Oh, so, okay. It's in our description. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, I'm an artist as well, and I've painted the human figure, um, female and male, with all its glory, repeatedly. <laughs> okay, and I just, I just can't tell you the 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 um, primordial satisfaction of recreating the image of a male or a female um whether or not they're perfect is not really the, the 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 issue there's so so what i'm getting at i suppose i'm being a little bit metaphysical here but what i'm getting at is i think the understanding of your body is and and again i'm i'm, I'm speaking from someone who you know spent all those years trying to erase my physical appearance um it's it's just, I just think there's, there's things that switch on your will to live and your will to, to strive towards, you know, well-being. And there's things that, that switch them on and switch them off. And when you start talking about, um, so I just imagine that that person had no exposure to how wonderful the human body is, whatever shape it is. Um, because they, they, I'm just wondering what you think of this, that the mind is so consumed with all this, um, you know, the, the consumption on, on Instagram and Twitter or whatever it is, that there's just been no exposure to the, let's say the archetype of, you know, the, the, the female form and the male form and just the, the form that, you, that you've been given, you know. And I, and right. I'm not religious, so I'm not getting religious here, but... There's, there's, I, as, as someone who's been through those different processes of walking away from suicide and then walking away from uh, an eating disorder, um, I came to the conclusion that every single day your, your body's like just, just buzzing with activity to get you up in the morning. Your body's like working while you conveniently go to sleep. You know, we pop sleeping tablets and we go to sleep, and your, your body's like, furiously at work yeah fixing things and building things and making more shit and literally and all sorts of other things you know and it just amazes me that we wake up in the morning and we go fuck it i don't need that right exactly you know? it just amazes me so so i just hope that there's there's a there's a there's a gap there that that person hasn't had the exposure and that's why they think like that they either have not had the exposure or they've had exposure that was, you know, embodied of trauma, right? That's kind of what I had, a good point. Um, you know, it's just both, I'd say, because not only did I not, I was um, not able to experience the use of my body that I wanted, right? Like intimacy and love and affection and sex and like positive and even just exercise, right? Even just physically doing something with that energy or, you know, um, so that was part of it. But also, you know, I did have like negative experiences, I suppose, with my body and, you know, not nearly as negative as I think some people, like I didn't have any sexual trauma, um, but I did have a little bit of physical trauma. And, um, uh, and uh, you know, just, I mean, there's a physical trauma that happens when you neglect your body. Like when you're, you know, as overweight as I was, and you have acne and all you can see is just how disgusting you are, you know, even though there's just these really little flaws. And if you look at like your entire e ecosystem of your body, though, you're looking at like a couple, I don't know, you know, blemishes on a beautiful photograph. Like, you know, my acne. Yeah, it looked bad. It was unhealthy. And my fat looked bad and it was unhealthy. But like, 
everything else about my body was working totally fine, you know, and everything was going as it should. I could still talk and eat and, you know, well, mostly that's what I just did, talk and eat <laughs> and sleep. Uh, but, you know, if you're not appreciating your body, that's why I'm, you know, I've, I will continue to say this and to myself as well. This is also a reminder, Laura, listen up, but, um, you know, embodied physical experience, like actual sensory experience, even if it's just burning a fucking stick of incense or a candle, use your sense yeah. of smell. You see all factory sense. Um, you're looking at a beautiful piece of art or just feeling the wind or like I went into the woods this week. It was really, really, really good. It was just so good. And, um, you know, I didn't listen to anything like I could have probably still had a good time, like putting on a podcast or what I usually do. Um, to distract my busy brain, but I didn't. I, it was silence besides the noises of the woods. It was sunset. It was really gorgeous. And um, it was that sensory experience of like, you know, I get, I don't like sensory experience because I'm so sensitive because it's just so stimulating. Like, I don't like winter, partly because I don't like wearing all those clothes. I don't like having to put on a hat and gloves and like a heavy coat. That's part of why I don't like it because it's too stimulating. But I did expose myself to the sun and there it was a bit chilly and I put on a hat and gloves and like and it was really really beautiful and I think we've lost a lot of that because we don't need to be exposed to the elements and then our body gets used to being in this like basically sterile you know ecosystem of our houses and like if we're spending all our time in this tiny little box like yeah I I, I mean I purposely made my tiny little box like jungle themed for a fucking reason right like i see i have yeah. trees and fake plants and green all around me for a reason um but it's nothing compared to the sensory you know experience so i i think that's a huge problem i mean um and again i don't know what this person experienced but if you're that detached from your body as if to cavalierly say like oh well i really don't need it like they're not doing anything for me so who even cares it's like <laughs> it's just it, it, they are doing something yeah. and i'll say this like you know not to be depressing but it's just the reality and it is very tragic and sad is that i mean i just go about my time sometimes i don't notice certain parts of my body right like i don't notice my feet all the time uh i don't you know but some but and i don't notice like my chest all the time but sometimes i do notice my chest and when i do notice it I, if I think about it, it does feel like there's something missing. Like it feels like there's something not there. It feels like part of me is gone. And I remember what it felt like to have something there. Like a part of me is gone. And it's very, you know, it, it's, it's a very sad experience. So to say that it's not doing anything like, yeah, I'm not technically, and I never have like breastfed or use them, you know, sexually as I might've wished or whatever, but like, they were still literally part of my body that I very much took for granted. And now I regret the fact that I didn't respect my own body and, and life force that actually exists really to give myself life and connection and literally like nurturing and nutrients to another life form potentially. Right. So to say that you don't need a certain part of your body is really, really nihilistic. Yo. Laura, I'm, I'm like welling up here. That was just such a beautiful. Oh, thank you. I, uh, that is my intention. It's just. I could have, I could have listened to that the rest of the day, quite frankly. <laughs> oh, um, really? <laughs> um, I hope everyone else appreciated that. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of, I want to, I had some clever ideas while you were talking, but it's such a, that connection to to what your body is is not two different things. It's the same thing. Exactly. You know, and and your mind doesn't doesn't let you escape that. You know, um, and I, I just if if we go back to what um, that person said, there's this feeling of like almost retaliation, um, which I, I, as, a, as a as a recovering Catholic, I think I, I, I relate to this quite well. That you know, Catholics have these rituals where you go and um, you, know, you get on your knees for, for twenty minutes and you ask forgiveness for your sins. Um, this, these rituals of of yes, actually, you can be angry at God. You know, you can um, 
it, there's like permission to do that. It's built into the system, uh, which I think is so so helpful because this is where it matters. Mm. That the the expression of I think it's quite natural to 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 be frustrated. I mean, you pointed out my own um, uh, struggle with these things, and I, I just while you were talking, I just had a memory of um, doing something similar. Um, when I was in the middle of this orthorexic phase, um, going to a, a mountainous area here in South Africa and climbing up this quite a hectic trail, there was no one around. You know, if I'd slipped and fallen, I probably would have died there. Um, and I got to the top of this mountain and it overlooked these other hills. And I was just like, you know, the fact that my body provides this experience is just incredible just miraculous you know but on the other hand what i'm what i'm connecting here is that I, the reason i climbed that mountain was because i had this idea that i wanted to go to this place climb to the top of the mountain where i knew nobody would hear me and scream at god so i used my body to get to this place you know and and i did i stood on this mountain and i screamed at god for all the shit that that i'd been um, exposed to that had nothing to do with my own choices, you know, and you know that that I was I think I was up there for a, a good while, an hour or two, and I, I sobbed for quite a while. Um, I was just amazed that like there was no human in sight, you know, and and I'm having this this absolutely incredible experience. But the, but the the fact that I'd used my body to get to this this hill um, was 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 sort of impressed on me, you know, because it was a tough hill. It wasn't like a simple thing. Mm-hmm. So if I'd carried on with my orthorexia, I probably would have made it up that hill, quite frankly. Mm. Um, but at this phase, I was starting to recover from it. Um, but I'm, I just want to share this one little detail with you all that I, after I'd sobbed a bit, and you know what they say about the tears clear your vision, you know, um, and I felt like the air in my lungs was like new air. Mm. And the 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 light that I was seeing through my eyes was like suddenly clearer, and I, I looked down and there was a piece of um, stone, like slate stone, that's quite easy to scratch on, um, lying at my feet. And I picked it up, and I scratched the word "reveal" on this piece of stone. Um, what I meant by that was, we have to perform these rituals and these. Um, uh, ceremonies, let's call them, um, which which I just realized while you were talking, they involve um, accepting the anger at, at at the universe or God or whatever it is, and dealing with it, you know, and then crying about it. And I'm obviously I'm talking about one specific little incident, but crying about it, but then taking the lesson from it, you know. I've still got that stone today, by the way. That's mm. like 20 years later. I still got that stone, and every time I find it in my cupboard, I get this little chill of, oh my God, from that day on, I went out of my way to reveal myself to myself. Yes. You know, warts and all. Um, And that has been an amazing journey, you know, so. That's a um, very beautiful story. Just, yeah, just just to, because what you were saying was so similar um, and the fact that you can, you know, you can go out there amongst all these things that are still happening in your life and just simply appreciate your body in the world. You know, it's just such a beautiful thing. And, and you know, every now and then the religions get it right because they mm-hmm. actually ritualize these things for us. Right. So they take, you know, in, in, for example, in African culture, they take very young boys at 15 and they take them out into the wilderness and they send them on a very spiritual, I think it's a three or four day survival. Um, they have to go out on their own in different directions and survive on their own. And I know this, this has actually been copied in a lot of boys um, like camps in the West and in America, I believe as well, but it's actually a, a, a traditional thing. And I think it exists in a lot of traditional cultures because they recognize the power of the boy being out there on his own and realizing that he's got nothing else to depend on but his own body and and nature, you know, and the world around him. So 
you know, I just I just think we really um, hit on a, a lesson there, and the and the the things that those comments are completely missing. You know, the the, the really important elements that they're missing and they don't understand. Um, and that's why I wanted to challenge that that thing about the internalized misogyny because I think it's correct, but it's the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, which is why I know my thing that I always talk about and will continue to talk about is radical acceptance. Um, and oh, I wanted to mention also like it's very interesting how you like you utilized your anger to overcome what was upsetting yeah. you. You you integrated yeah. it, right? You didn't run from it. You didn't turn it in on yourself. You went outwards. You didn't turn it in on another person. You didn't harm anybody, but you integrated yeah. your anger. And that's sort of what I did when I went to the woods this week was I went back to the place where um, a very hurtful individual um, traumatized me um, that last year on my birthday, and I hadn't been back since. And it's such a beautiful place. That's why I went there on my birthday to celebrate it. Confronted. Yeah. So I went here. And I confronted it and it was sad and there was some, you know, triggering sort of similar elements to last year, but it was a completely new experience. And, it, you know, I really felt an appreciation by, you know, I went out of my way to say, you know what, I'm going to confront this. And not only am I going to confront it, but I'm going to have gratitude for it. And I ended up having like every time I go into the woods, I know like, yeah, I'm going to enjoy this. I'm going to get some pretty pictures. But every single time I do it, it's just so transcendent. It's like more transcendent every single time I do it. And this week, like as soon as I got done, because it got cold, literally I just left because it was like completely dark out by that time, sunset. And um, I was like, oh, I can't wait to go back. Like I really can't wait to come back here wow. and like take more photos. And I, you know, I'm going to do that. That's partly yeah. why I'm trying to take photography classes. So I have like an excuse to mo like motivate myself to actually go out. Because like I said, yeah. it's a pain to like when you get you accustomed to the inside world and you go into the outside world, it's like, whoa. Yeah. Um, but I went out of my way to confront that pain in a productive way. And I think that's what's happening is like we're just sitting around all the time. These young people, they're sitting around all the time online and they don't have a productive outlet so they turn it in back on themselves because they don't have a physical person there they only have a screen and they get so enraged physically they react so intensely um in their bodies and then all that's left is an empty void of a screen with no one really there to talk to or really respond to you and just yourself you're just left in a room by yourself with your body with your like increased heart rate and like activated nervous system and you know the sympathetic nervous system and it's like what else are you gonna do but just hate yourself you know that you're mm. hating the thing that's experiencing all these this pain and believe me like dude i experienced just like i, I don't even want to brag but like yeah i experience so much pain like all the time like i really 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 do but i've realized over the years like my body is capable of experiencing not just an intense amount of pain, but an intense amount of pleasure as well. If I actually focus on that more so I can focus on like, you know, the hour a day that I weep intensely and I, you know, my heart just burns, you know, into ash every day. Or I can focus on the kind of phoenix rising from that ash from yeah. the rest of like the 23 hours that I feel like really like alive with like it, like if you saw my body if you saw my x-ray it feels like it's like vibrating so intensely that's why when i cry i like physically shake from the power of it of my own body it's really a beautiful experience now i wish it happened a little less frequently when i you know break People down can't but... see me now but i'm waving my hand <laughs> <laughs> preach funk god absolutely that's why i spread the gospel um... of funk I just want to point out hey, that that what you're talking about there in those last few minutes um, is is the uh, the burden of many of us, and you know we we spoke about this in the third factor podcast as well. Um, the burden of many of us who, for whatever reasons, whatever the factors are that combine to create this hyper awareness, you know, like you were saying earlier about. You don't want to put on so many clothes in winter because it's oversensitizing you. That might sound weird to some people because it's like, no, but it's protecting you from sensation, you know. Problem is, though, 
people like us, and be, because I'm older, I might sound like I'm a hell of a lot more resilient, and of course I am, but um, I very much, um, what, I, what I always say to Laura when we we're chatting privately is we're simpatico, which is the Italian or Latin phrase for um, being sympathetic to each other's um, world, you know, because um, this is exactly what I'm talking about. Um, when you, as you were speaking there about how wonderful those moments are, um, that's exactly what I'm talking about. So just to focus on that one example where I climbed this mountain, um, I just remembered I, I actually cried on the way up the mountain as well. I was an emotional wreck that day, and I'd driven. Um, okay, I did. I did uh, rent a cabin um, to stay over, but I'd driven four or five hours to get to this place. I woke up the next day, and my sole mission was to get to the top of this hill and do this little ritual of mine that I just made up in my mind. Um, but having said that, when I came down, I was, um, yeah, it was just ecstasy. It was just, and I came back from that trip like a completely different person, you know. Um, and yes, of course, it doesn't always last. Obviously, a week or two later, maybe you were feeling depressed again because the actual circumstances of your life don't always completely change just because your internal um, perspective has shifted. But there is no, um, it, there's no stopping the internal shift, uh, I believe. It's actually, I think that's when we become uh, extremely depressed and that's when we um, develop you know, pathologies is when we're trying to block that process. But the, 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 the crying and recovering is, is, a, is almost like the layering of the onion or maybe that's not the best um, analogy, but you, you know what I mean? Like this, the layering of the cake, let's say. You know, to, to get to the point that you can put candles on and light the bloody cake, mm. you've got to layer the cake, you know. And I, I'm so conscious of being older, and 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 I, sometimes people just assume, oh well, he's kind of speaking as an older person, and sounds like. But I've been through so many different cycles of this, and I can promise you that the the coming out of it is better every time. Yes, it's better every time. Yes, there's a there's a, a bit of a fallacy that uh, I've seen it in psychology research that they say um, your peak experiences are in your adolescence. Okay, they might be speaking about very specific sensations, but I can tell you that your your peak experience of life, just of being alive, of being a human being on this rock orbiting the sun, increases as you get older. Um, and it's, it's, I mean, it's literally why some elderly people are so blasé about so many things, because they know that the, the real miracle happens every morning. It's not, you know, it's not this, some other thing that they're waiting to happen. So, uh, you know, just if, if, if we can summarize like what we've been speaking about today, it's this, um, how the ideology masks all these, these journeys that we should be facing bravely and with, with with conviction, you know, mm -hmm. and, and together, you know, this is the, this is the problem is that so much of the discourse on, on social media is so shallow and so fickle. It doesn't talk about this kind of stuff. You know, I mean, I know there is a lot of um, motivational stuff, but I just worry that it, it, because it's often from a sort of top down perspective, it's often like these gurus that are telling us to, to be stronger and, and, <laughs> yeah, that's um, us right now, the two gurus. Well, we, 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 but we're giving people experiences. You know, we're telling people this is how we got through it. And actually, neither of us are saying that figured it out. Right. There's, there won't be any other challenges. Um, but to, to, to discern the difference between the nihilism of those posts, and I know it's Twitter, we're just using that as an example, but the nihilism that you can see in those posts um, as opposed to the, the seeking of truth and the exposure of, of um, you know, opportunistic behavior that your letter represents, for example. Mm -hmm. you know, there's, a, there's a distinction there that I think is really worth pointing out. And you know, normally I wouldn't want to sort of isolate people's comments on Twitter because that's... Uh, Certainly when it comes to politics, that doesn't really serve much good. But in this particular context, I think it's so obvious that there's this nihilistic, um, uh, and when I say consumerist mentality, I'm talking about 
how Foucault um, put it, this idea that you can don't commit suicide, instead just abuse everything, mm -hmm. you know, abuse and use everything. I mean, he literally said, he made a comment, for example, if, if you can see how this relates to the, to the, the surgery aspect now, he made a comment, and I'm paraphrasing, but basically that sex is so transcendental, the act of sex is so transcendental that it's worth dying for. So do you see how this, this idea that you can have surgeries that are life-threatening for, the, for, the, for the, the opportunity at some kind of transcendence is, mm -hmm. is embedded in, 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 in their thinking, you know? And right. even though these people might not specifically know Foucault, they're influenced by that idea, by this idea of... Um, the born-again uh, Christian um, substitute, basically. Like, they're, like, it's just like you said, when you climbed that mountain, right? You were almost like born again, in a way. And, yeah, um, yeah. you know, it's like, and you get born again every time you go through that cycle of going into the ash and rising as the phoenix and burning again. Yeah, but, you know, yeah. but this is like a permanent, I mean, everything is permanent. We all, like, age and everything. But, like, I, you know, I have heard a lot of people talk about how it's, this, you know, because it's, again, like a spiritual crisis, right? So, like, they're searching for the transcendence and themselves and but they're turning it in on themselves and they hate themselves and then they think that they can find transcendence in themselves by turning themselves yes. into something that they are not and then yes. um you know they try to be born again and that's why like you hear you know like excellentic talk about like you know uh trans you know rights like r i t e s like it's like a religious rite of passage all these different things um and um, it's a substitute for, you know, the lack of rituals, basically. Like, we don't even have yeah. to say religious, but just rituals in huh? general, like coming of age rituals, you know, and other just things we've seemed to have lost because we're so fascinated with the Internet and adults are so fascinated with the digital culture and everything is so fast now that we're moving so quickly that we really have lost track of like kind of the just the slower, traditional, methodical route to just developing and growing and yeah. Um, yeah. in general. So I, I, actually, that, that, that's, a, that's a very good tie to what I was saying earlier, that I've got, the, if, if you take the evolutionary psychology perspective, um, and, and I think a lot of psychology supports this anyway, but this idea that I think what, when we ask what is the function of rituals, and rights, rights of passage, okay? The function of those things, I believe, is to signal to your body, and this, is, this, this does tie in with um, that book, Anti-Fragility. He also talks about this kind of concept of how when you break a bone, it grows back stronger, okay? So there's, that's a very, a very obvious example of how damage and, and resistance builds resilience which um, empowers you to, to, to survive, to keep going. Okay. But I think there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a metaphysical layer here that the, by ignoring the rites and the rituals, which, which have been sort of embodied in our, or um, uh, adopted in our, uh, as a human species, okay, let's say over the last 50,000 years, let's say, you know, it's silly things. I mean, anything from, you know, um, the mother giving physical birth, you know, the, the baby's initial trauma of just coming into the world. It's a, it's a shock. And I believe your whole body, your cell, your very DNA goes, it tells everything else to live. You know? <laughs> and and that, that sparks all the other systems, you know, the well-being systems, the health systems, the, the right down to the digestive systems. I mean, it's no secret that a lot of um, uh, somatic complaints, um, you know, bodily function and feeling uh, complaints uh, originate from from the psyche. Okay, that's no secret, and that's that's not uh, mumbo jumbo. That we all know that. Um, but it's just funny to me that we often don't talk about how it's those the rites, the rituals, and the rites are a deliberate way of instigating those those stages of change, those different life stage changes that are so essential. So instead what we do is we go and we find them in the outside world. You know, we go and we create them. 
um, uh, uh, you know, I don't want to uh, drag out this particular episode with um, more personal experiences, but I mean, I think anyone can look back on their lives and think about the times when they when they walked into a situation um, or a relationship or a job where they knew it was going to be difficult. And, you know, there might have been a period where they were like, oh, God, I knew this was going to be hard. And why am I here? And why can't I get out? But for us to look back and say that that was a waste of time is, is you're already slipping towards the nihilistic um, way of thinking. And, mm. and this is kind of my approach to counseling is that as soon as you switch that just slightly change the course of direction. You start ad 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 adapting and adopting um, uh, responses and, and methods that bring you to this existential crisis, which is, why do I need this body part? Why don't I have, um, as you were saying, these internalized processes that can make me feel transcendent? Right. You cannot possibly internally transcend Otherwise, you never left your mother's womb. You would mm. have just stayed there and, and just transcended, you know, and then died. <laughs> you know, I mean, obviously, I'm being really simplistic, but um, it, it, a lot of what you're saying is how, uh, you know, and, and you and I spoke about this once before, and I said to you that the, the most overwhelming thing when I heard a lot of your story, your, your, your transitioning and then detransitioning story, the overwhelming thing that I felt after that very long conversation we had once was survival. Mm -hmm. It was just survival. It was like, oh, my God, you survived. I wanted to, like, reach through the screen and give you a massive hug because what an incredible achievement. I mean, you did. Yeah. It was a messy path, yes. Yeah. And there was some collateral damage. <laughs> yeah. And there's lots of things you haven't resolved. I mean, you've never said that you've resolved everything, you know. Oh, I'm, I have I would, not, not said that. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And I'd be suspicious of anyone who said they did anyway. Right, right. You know what my grandpa says yeah. is like, um, whenever, you know, I say anything. And, you know, I am usually pretty upbeat around him because, like, it's impossible to be nihilistic around him because the only thing he ever says if I complain about something is, you know, he just says, well, shit happens. That's life literally and for me it's like you're not gonna give me any room to talk about my troubles and I you know it's just like you know that's a little bit too much for me too simplistic but like that's what he says and every single day when I come down you know I've been up all night and he's coming up at like 7 a.m or whatever he says like ah he looks out the window and he says another fine day that's what he says oh, and wow. every night my aunt calls him at 9 30 and she says you know how was the day today and he's like just peachy another fine day it's just it's going you know just peachy that's what he always says it's another fine day you know Laura, are you sure you're related uh well my dad's in between there so we could <laughs> dive into that another time <laughs> but um i mean my grandpa i'm not gonna get into it but he did have like a cancerous tumor taken out of his brain a few years ago and the doctors say it's like a miracle that he's even alive um and he wow. you know he's just like the literally the most chill person that yeah. i've ever met it's like dude how are you even functioning you don't go on twitter yeah. you don't go on twitter he doesn't yeah. even have he doesn't have a phone he doesn't even but he has a dog and he loves that dog and he feeds the birds and he has like 15 turkeys that come like every day wow. yeah he he's really got the birds <laughs> but you know so it's just like as you said you know older people you know and i don't know it's a i don't know it's a, just a very beautiful thing and, and so i've been trying to just have more gratitude and appreciation for it i guess the one wonderful thing about the internet um just to bring it all the way full circle is you can do these kinds of things, you know, and you and I never met in person, but we're connecting across thousands of miles and, you know, totally different cultures. And, um, you know, we, we were chatting on, uh, on Thanksgiving. Um, Laura and I had a, had a bit of a Thanksgiving of our own, um, yeah. which, was, which was such fun. But um, we were just chatting about how just, just being appreciative of things that we do have you know, rather than constantly focusing on the things we don't have. And um, to, to, to 
tie up what I'm been saying and and what I was kind of hoping we could we could cover and we we, we did it so well in this in this episode um, is just this idea of recognizing how ideology draws you towards nihilism and it switches off all the flourishing signals that your body is looking for. Whereas the opposite um, of uh, adopting a pursuit, um, appreciating your environment, appreciating the, the, even if it's one person around you, all of a sudden switches on these appreciation um, mechanisms. And, and that's how you start taking the steps towards um, those moments of transcendence that you'll have in your life. And, and they'll only be moments, but wow, when they happen, they're just transcendental. Right. And when they happen and you become more mindful of them, you'll, no, see, you'll notice that they're happening more frequently, more, more, more and more and more. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And for longer periods of time. And I've also noticed that I'm in the nihilistic phase a much shorter amount of time than yeah. I used to be. Um, okay. Well, let's leave it at that. That's, yeah. um, I think that's a beautiful message. Um, as usual, thanks for listening. This is episode two of Tron Psyche. It's Laura and Vincent, and we're going to put some links in the notes so that you can uh, link to what we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. And remember, like and subscribe and be careful what you post on Twitter, my friends. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening to Tron Psyche. If you want to add your thoughts on these topics, let's discuss them in the public forum on Twitter at TranPsychePod. That's T-R-A-N-S-P-S-Y-C-H-E-P-O-D. We need your help bringing these issues to a larger audience. You can contribute to the discussion by clicking the like button on your favorite audio platform, YouTube, and subscribing to the show so you can keep up with the conversation. You can connect with both Laura and Vincent on Twitter or email the show at transpsychepodcast at gmail.com. We appreciate hearing from you. We're also on Patreon. You can become a supporter at transpsychepodcast at patreon.com. If you know someone who might benefit from these ideas, please share the show with your friends and family on social media. Please remember this podcast is for discussion purposes only and is not intended as mental health advice or counseling. 